Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that was good. I didn't, didn't expect that. I thought I'd have to do that a couple times. All right, everybody having a good time? All right, we're going to get right to it. Have you had your, I had three cups of coffee. How much coffee have you had? I'm raring to go. Maybe I get one more cup in before I start. All right, we're going to get started. I'm going to talk to you about the Content Inc. model today, a little bit about content marketing for those of you that aren't familiar with it. But uh, you know, this year, believe it or not, I'll do about 70 uh, keynote and workshop presentations around content marketing. And I've learned that there is actually one key to a successful presentation. You might say, hey, maybe it's sense of humor, maybe you'll laugh at some of my jokes, uh, maybe it's uh, relevant case studies, uh, maybe it's actionable tips. So whatever you have in your head that you want out of this presentation, you're most likely wrong. Uh, the answer to a successful presentation is when the speaker sets incredibly low expectations for the presentation. So I'm going to set your incredibly low expectations for you, and I want you to get one thing. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you 10 takeaways and things to think about regarding your content marketing program. But I, there are going to be some that you're going to say, we can't do that. That's not relevant to us. That doesn't make sense. I want you to find the one thing. So in this presentation, I want you to really look for what's that one thing that you can do and take and make actionable in your work when you go back, not this week, hopefully, maybe next week and get started and, and think a little bit differently about how we communicate with our customers. Do a little bit of overview here. So let's go back to when Al Gore created the internet and talk about the website, right? So all us, you know, we're, we're SEO folks, we're marketers. Uh, we are trying to figure this whole thing out. And in the, you know, let's say the 90s when the website was created, this was fantastic. This was great for marketers because we could take all that sales information, all that product feature information, and we can now stick it up on the web. This was like one of the greatest inventions ever. We're like, oh, thank goodness, we can shoot all of our stuff, talk about ourselves, put it up on the web, and we'll attract and retain customers by doing that. The second greatest invention, of course, social media, right? Oh my goodness, we're gonna take all our products and service information, we're gonna shove it in blogs and wikis and Twitter and Facebook. It's just gonna be the greatest thing ever. And then we, unfortunately, figured out that all that stuff we were putting up there, nobody cares about. Nobody cares about our products and services. Nobody cares about our features and benefits. They care about themselves, their own pain points. So as we started to get into the, the, the creation of our website, and as we started to look at our communicating on social media, most of the information that we send up there is about ourselves, and simply it's not getting attention. It hasn't worked for us. Why can our customers ignore us? Why are they? Because if you look in you know, before 1990, there were only eight different channels that our customers could get information. That means they were forced to listen to what we had to say. Only limited channels. Well, today, there's unlimited channels, right? They can, they can absolutely ignore us at will. They don't have to pay any attention to us at all. And so because, even because we've got 24-7 access, they, they have 24-7 access to all the information through a smartphone, and we have unlimited opportunity to publish. Publishing is near zero at cost when you think about it. It doesn't match unless we start to figure out how we're going to communicate to those pain points and figure out how we're going to cut through the clutter with all these channels we have to deal with. So everyone's flocking to this thing called content marketing, probably the fastest growing area of internet marketing right now. What is content marketing? So I'll level set it. I've only got a few slides of definition, but I want to make sure, what are we thinking about when we think about pure content marketing? It's all about how do we create valuable, relevant, and compelling content on a consistent basis to a targeted audience to see some profitable action. But really what we want to do is we want to figure out how do we build audiences. We want to build an audience that's going to know, like, and trust us over time. If content marketing was a stock, you don't want to own it. There's a Google Trends chart of content marketing over the last few years. I started, I started right here, actually. Really, nobody was talking about it. Nobody even knew what that was in 2007 when we started talking about content marketing. Now everybody has some idea what content marketing is, and they're trying to use it in their business. According to our latest research that, by the way, there's a short link, bit.ly link, it's all free and ungated if you want to check out our latest research with marketing profs. Basically, nine out of 10 businesses are doing some form of content marketing, at least what they believe to be content marketing. So everybody's using content marketing in some way, but here's the stat that makes me cry, 30%. This year, we just finished our latest research, B2B, B2C, and nonprofit research, and the average effectiveness rate for marketers is 30%, three in 10. 30%, it just makes, it's just miserable. So nine out of 10 companies are using content marketing, just three in 10. If you're, yeah, if you're 
uh, Daniel Murphy and you're batting 300, this is fantastic. You're going to the All-Star game. You're going to the World Series. If you're a marketer, you're getting fired. This is not going to work. We've got to do better than 30%. Why only 30%? We're still thinking about content marketing as campaigns. Content marketing is a marathon and not a sprint. So we've got to think about the long term, building an audience over time. We're still talking too much about ourselves. 55% of marketers, according to our research, this is the one that kills me, they have no idea what success looks like with their content marketing program. They're just doing great blogs and podcasts and videos, but they don't know ultimately what success looks like. And the majority of companies actually don't have a documented strategy of any kind. So think about that. Think about how many, so much investment in content marketing, yet the majority of marketers out there have no idea what success looks like and have no documented strategy. This is a problem. We're treating content like an advertising campaign. We can't do that. And the Donald is unhappy with this. How about, you want a different one? How about this one? Yeah. The Don, we need to do better. We need to do better. We want, we want to make the Donald happy, right? So let's, let's do better. I really believe there's a better way to think about this. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. What can, how can we change how we're looking at communicating with our customers and the content we create to actually create better customers out of this? So I'll tell you a little bit of a story. Uh, here's my little orange notebook that I have all my goals, my, my personal goals, financial goals, family goals, and I write those down. And one of my personal career goals is I want to write a book every two years. So I started in 2009 with the first book, wrote one in 2011, Epic Content Marketing came out in 13, and the most recent one, which is sitting up here, is, uh, is Content Inc., and I just, that just came out last month. So I'm like, what am I going to write about? Uh, I said, well, Maybe I write about what we did at Content Marketing Institute. Maybe we talk about, hey, we had very few resources. We were able to focus on building an audience. We built out that model, lo the loyalty model there. And then we started launching products and services once we built a loyal audience. And then I said, well, nobody's going to want to read about a book about me. That's terrible. That's completely counterintuitive to content marketing. We need to do better. So I went out searching. I went out searching for companies that were building an audience first through a content first approach and then launching products and services on the back of this. Now, the book's title talks about entrepreneurs and the subtitle talks about how entrepreneurs can build massive audiences. What we found is this model for, you can use this model for any size company. So whatever industry you're in, whatever size company, whatever role, you can take this model we're gonna go through and you can absolutely integrate it into what you're doing in a business. But it's, just, it's the same idea. We have to create value with our customers through how we communicate first, and then we monetize it, whatever that is. And we're going to talk about the different ways you monetize it. So as I went out, I'm actually looking. Are there other companies out there that are doing this? And what we realized is, and this is what blew me away, there were dozens and dozens, even hundreds of different companies all over the world in all different industries that were doing this, that were following a content-first, audience-first approach. And as we went and we started to do the research and looked at each one of these companies, we reverse engineered the model. And we looked at what are they doing? Are they, is there a formula here that each one of them were using? And what we realized, this is probably the most fascinating thing as you're going through and you're doing research for a book. We actually found that every company did the same six steps. Everyone followed the same formula. So as most of us kind of lucked into it, we thought it was the right way to go, we actually found that there's a formula here that we can all use so that you don't have to waste time and think about it anymore. You can actually follow this formula and drive revenues significantly if you follow these six steps. So this is what we call the Content Inc. model. I'm going to go through all six steps here. I'm going to give you many case studies on, on what we found and different ways to look at it and think about how you communicate with your customers. And the first of the six steps is the sweet spot. So let me start with step one. Step one is a sweet spot. And here is what we think about with the sweet spot. And every one of you has a sweet spot, whether you've identified it or not. It's if you're a small company, you're probably doing it around some key passion area. If you're a larger company, it's some customer pain point. And that intersects with some area that you actually have authority to communicate on. Where do you have a knowledge or skill that you can actually communicate and people will believe you? So that's what we call the sweet spot. Let me give you an example. Anybody know this guy? I love this case study. This is the chicken whisperer. This is Andy Schneider. He is the foremost expert in the world on raising chickens in your backyard. This actually is a thing. I actually <laughs> talked to Andy. This is actually what he does. He's built a multi-million dollar platform 
off of teaching people how to raise chickens in, the, in their backyard. And Andy, basically, he started as a hobby. He's on a, in a suburb in Atlanta, and he wanted to raise chickens in his backyard. And he's like, went to Google and tried to find information, couldn't find anything on how to do it. Then he started to talk to experts, and he started to educate himself, and he started to become the leading expert. And then his neighbors, you know, he's doing a pretty good job raising chickens in his backyard. And his neighbors said, hey, Andy, we want to do that too. Starts getting little neighborhood meetups around raising chickens in your backyard. So he started to do that. And then he started to get calls from other cities and said, Andy, would you come out and meet up with us? Went up, started to do meetup.org sessions, and he started to go all over the United States doing special meetup groups around raising chickens in your backyard. This is Andy. Of course, he's holding a live chicken here. Wouldn't have it any other way. So he's built this platform. And he actually took that meetup formula and he put it into a radio show. So if you can see how this works, so he's basically he's got the radio show during the week, 20,000 listeners a week listen to Andy Schneider. People, I mean, that's a lot of people that want to raise chickens in their backyard. But look at this, Monday's the chicken doctor with Peter Brown. Why is that so important? Because over the weekend the chickens got sick. We got to do something, what are we going to do? So we're going to, have, we're going to have the chicken doctor on Monday. So he's thinking about his programming and how that's going to work. I'll get more on to Andy a little bit later, but think about it. So what was Andy's sweet spot? Loves teaching, passionate about teaching, would teach anyone anything. He absolutely was passionate about that. Gets up in the morning thinking about this stuff. Became the foremost authority in backyard poultry. That's the sweet spot. Let me give you an example that's been going on for 120 years. See if you can figure this one out. Let's say on the one side we are, you know, the pain point is farmers and how do they can get more out of their farm? How can small businesses drive more revenue? How do they treat their employees? How do they get more corn out of, out of the uh, land? Whatever the case is. And then on the other side, let's say our expertise area is we know more about technology and agriculture than anyone else in the world. Anybody know who this is? John Deere, very good. You get a free book. There you go. This is the Furrow Magazine. I love this, by John Deere. Started in 1895. And if you said, Joe, who's the largest media company in the farming industry? I would tell you it's not a media company. It's actually John Deere. 1.5 million subscribers, 40 countries, 14 different languages. It is now a print and digital publication. And if you think about how we communicate, and I talked to the production team for the Furrow, and I said, how many how many times over the 120 years have you mentioned John Deere products into your content over 120 years? They said, but between 13 and 15 times in 120 years. They're not talking about themselves, right? They're focusing on the pain points of their customers as they go. So we're going to talk more about Andy later. Sweet spot is step one. You're all doing the sweet spot in some way. It's the content tilt. This is the mo By the way, you haven't created any content yet. This is all strategy. The content tilts what's super important. Let me talk about the content tilt, how you really differentiate yourself. Here's Ann Reardon. Ann Reardon is known as the baking queen of Sydney, Australia. She wanted to start a baking blog and start, start some baking videos. She had 100 subscribers in January 2012. Now she now has over 2 million subscribers on YouTube. Here's what it looks like. She's baking. She's having a good time. It's howtocookthat.net. She's really successful, but I want you to think about this. Let's say you want, you're want Ann, and you want to start a baking video series and try to get attention. How many baking videos and blog posts are there on the web today? Thousands, millions. How is Ann, with her low production quality to start with video, how is she going to cut through the clutter and get any kind of attention? There's no way it's going to work. Absolutely no way, unless she's telling a different story. So this is with the link between the sweet spot and the content tilt. Every, you all have a sweet spot, but what most companies do is they start creating content from the sweet spot. You can't do that. You've got to take the other step, and you've got to figure out how you tilt that content. How do you find an area, a content niche on the web that has little to no competition that you actually have a fighter's chance to break through? And a lot of you SEO experts know this, but we're talking about things that aren't being talked about that will be talked about where you can actually be the leading expert at something. How do you take five pounds of Snickers bars and put them in a cake? Does that look good this morning? I don't know if it does. <laughs> but it's right there. So she focused on, so this is one of Ann's recipes. She said, well, how do we do that? Five pounds of Snickers bars, put it into a cake. Anybody see this one? 
This, so Anna's the Instagram cake lady. How do you, perfect replica of the Instagram logo, and how do you, this looks quite complicated, doesn't it? So what is Anne's content tilt? What is her different story where she's gonna cut through the clutter and make this thing work and get attention? Sweet spot, there it is up at the top, but it's the content tilt that makes it all happen. She focused on impossible food creations. She did not do a, a recipe, she did not do a video, unless she asked herself, that's, that's gotta be impossible. People will think that's impossible to do. That was her content tilt, and that's why she broke through very quickly, that's why the Instagram uh, cake went viral, and that's where she had an opportunity to build an audience now over two million people. Let me give you an example of how this works. I know you're all probably very familiar with Google Trends. I think it's one of the most underutilized tools out there, but let's just say that Joe, I, for whatever reason, I don't know why I use this example, but let's say I want to start a knitting blog. So Joe's going to, I don't know anything about knitting, but I want to start a knitting blog. So I put knitting into Google Trends, and here's the relative search traffic over time on knitting. You, you see how it spikes every December, January? Why is that? Why does it spike every December, January? Be because it's getting cold here. I'm from Cleveland. It's really cold in Cleveland on the lake. Every Jan and also holiday presents, right? So the interest peaks up everywhere. So okay, that's something. But if you go out and you say, I want to start a knitting blog, you have to compete with all the other hundreds of other knitting blogs out there and you gotta actually pull attention from those to get any kind of attention at all. It's, not, it's probably not gonna work. So let's, let's break this down. What I wanna do is I wanna go into knitting and I wanna look at what the breakout terms are. So I'm gonna go all the way down to the right as you know. I'm clicking on rising. Yeah, now we've got some opportunities to actually talk about some different things. Knitting loom, the knitting loom is back. Look at it, it's breaking out. Knitting, knitting for beginners, double knitting, knitting cast on, doesn't matter, right? Look for whatever your industry is. This is what I care about. I'm not caring about necessarily as we think about search where we're going into, oh, here's what everybody's focusing on. I want to be the ones that are breaking out. I want to be the market leader in these ones that have yet to really grow. That's where the opportunity is at to tell a different story and to find your content niche. What most of us do with our content tilt is we go too broad. I want you to focus on the smallest possible, and this is why it's so hard. You've got to focus on the smallest possible area that you actually have a chance to be the leading expert in something. Now I want you to think about this. All media companies do this and we do not. All media companies, well, I've been on about 30 to 35 different launches of publishing properties, whether that be custom mag magazines, newsletters, webinar programs, social media. And every time we launch from a media standpoint, we always start with an editorial mission statement. It's like key, it's like the first couple days and we're putting together the strategy, editorial mission statement. Hardly any companies, any brands that sell products and services do this. And I think it's a missed opportunity, and I think you can really find two in your content tilt if you focus on this area. So I'm gonna help you, I'm gonna work on this with you as a little exercise, and we call this the content marketing mission statement. I'm gonna give you a few examples. So this is Homemade Simple. This is from Procter & Gamble. Homemade Simple's been up since 2003, believe it or not. Talk about a marathon and not a sprint. They have over two million, I think it's actually five million now, five million consumers that subscribed to regular updates from Homemade Simple from Procter & Gamble. So yes, I would like your sales information, P&G. That's the information that's so good, it doesn't seem like sales. That's what they're sending out. And they put together, a, this is a shortened version of their content marketing mission statement. And this is how you get started. Enabling women to have more quality time with their families. This is not about Procter & Gamble selling more Swiffer pads. This is all about the audience and what the audience's needs are. And we're gonna use this at the litmus test for all the content we create. Women have more quality time with their families. What are you not going to see here? You're not gonna see any six hour recipes, right? Why is that? Because it doesn't go to the mission. So as a content director, as a content manager, you can say, oh, you say somebody in your organization has a really good idea, you can say, oh, it doesn't go to the mission. It doesn't make sense for what we're trying to do and tell our story. So really, really important. Let's look at a B2B example. This is Indium Corporation. All of you might be thinking, well, maybe I've got a boring product or service and I can't do this. Well, this may be the most boring product on the planet. Indium Corporation manufactures industrial soldering equipment. So any of you that are thinking that you don't have sexy things to talk about, here you go. They started this blog in 2005 
In 18 months, they saw a 600% increase in qualified leads. It's worked very, very well for them. But they started with a content marketing mission statement. By the way, they have 70 engineers. I'm sorry, that's not right. 21 engineers creating 70 different blogs for Indium Corporation. But they started with this. Helping engineers answer the most challenging industrial soldering questions. That's all they're doing. They're only targeting engineers, one audience. They're not targeting, targeting plant managers. They're not targeting CFOs. Answer the most challenging industrial soldering questions. They're not talking about ball bearings. They're not talking about siding. That's all they're doing. There's a couple key things in this. They're targeting one audience. If you target more than, let's say, if you look at your B2B process, if you're a B2B company, and you have seven to nine decision makers in your process, most B2B companies, they try to target one, two, three, four audiences with their content. As soon as you go outside of one audience, you're already irrelevant. If you're targeting one, one, more than one persona with your content marketing strategy, you're probably going to fail. You have to just target one, and you want to be as specific as you possibly can. So let's go through the three. There's three areas of how you can do this. I'm gonna, this is Darren Rouse's digital photography school. Again, started by building an audience. Now he has a multi-million dollar platform in his digital photography school. He has his content marketing mission statement right on his site. Welcome to Digital Photography School, a website with simple tips to help digital camera owners get the most out of their cameras. Three parts. Who's my audience? Digital camera owners, right? What is going to be delivered? Simple tips. What is the outcome? The most important thing is the outcome for the audience, helping them get the most out of their cameras. This is very simple, right? This is not rocket science, but nobody does this. Every one of your content creators should be seeing this as part of their brief before they create any content for your particular niche. You will save so much money in the editing process if you give this up to them and you don't have to edit it after the fact. The second thing is, for those of you that maintain editorial or content marketing calendars, I want you to add outcome to that. So let's say, oh, here's the topic of the blog post. Here's the search engine keywords we're focusing on. Here's the approval process. And what, so go through that spreadsheet, whatever you use. And at the end, I want you to add outcome. What's in it for the audience? For that particular, are you trying to help them get a better job, live a better life? What is that particular thing? And you will, say, you will save so much. You'll get your ROI right then just because you'll save money in the editorial process and review process if you do that. Good little tip. So this is what I want you to do when you get back. This is probably next week. Think about what, how you create your content now. Do you have this? If you don't, go through the process. Define your audience. What are you going to deliver? What's the outcome? So you've identified your sweet spot. What's our content tilt? What's that area that we can actually be the leading expert in the world? How are we going to tell a different story? Because most, most of the companies we go and talk to, they're, tell, they're creating the same content as everyone else. You could take their logo, their branding off of it. You wouldn't even know it's coming from them. It just sounds like everything else in the industry. You've got to differentiate that story. Then, we haven't created content yet. Now we do. Now we're going to build the base. This is where it all gets started. Here's your content creation. So you're ready for this super complex strategy? Here's, a, here's the easiest strategy you will ever see. This is it. Every one of the case studies we look, reviewed and we talk about in the book followed the same exact strategy when it comes to building the base. And this is it. I actually, when we went through it, I'm like, can we get something more complicated <laughs> so that people believe it? This was it. We focus on one, con for the most part, we focus on one content type. Is it audio? Is it video? Is it textual? We focus on one main platform. Is it our blog or website? Is it iTunes? Is it YouTube? Consistently deliver that content. Is it every Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Is it every Saturday? What is it? Is it once a week? Is it twice a week? What is that? Very consistent. John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneur on Fire, who built a multi-million dollar platform off of his podcast, he sends out his podcast every day, 3.30 in the morning, Eastern time, and he's done it for three years. I just was on his podcast. I was podcast number 1159, believe it or not. So just, but 3.30 every day. So that was the key, consistency and over a long period of time. The shortest case study that we found to monetization, so starting this process, when you're starting a content first, audience first process, and then to get to actually driving revenue, shortest time, nine months. Average time, 15 to 17 months. 
You may say that's long, you may say that's not, I don't know what you're thinking, but what most companies do, they try to do this and within three months they're like, where's the leads? We need more, we wanna get value right away. You cannot extract value until you give value. You have to make sure you build a loyal relationship with them first. So that's building the base. Let's talk about a few examples. I know a lot of you know Brian Clark over at Copyblogger. He started blogging for 19 months before he got to monetization, right? So he's talking, so if you look at what, you know, you, many of you are probably familiar with it, three resources that will help you craft smarter landing pages. He's talking about online copywriting. He's talking about search engine optimization. He went from zero to one of the fastest growing software as a service companies on the planet by building 100,000 plus subscribers through blogging every day on his site. So textual content on his own platform every day over time, 19 months. Let's look at a video example. One of my favorite video examples. You large enterprises will like this. This is Yuska Bank from Denmark, one of the largest banks in Denmark. They were spending actually a lot of money, millions of dollars every year on sponsoring soccer tournaments. And the marketing team got together and they said, we don't want us, we don't even know what we're getting for that sponsorship. Can we do something else? And they said, let's build our own audience. Let's, let's try, let's do a television network. They started yuskabank.tv, believe it or not. This is inside the bank. This is inside the bank. And they actually have a tagline that says, we are the only media company with its own bank. <laughs> Isn't that something? I absolutely love that. So they started to build an audience, 24 seven financial news targeted to millennials every day on their own platform, creating the video. And what's so funny about this example is those same organizations that were charging them millions of dollars for sponsorship every year, they recently went back to Yuska Bank and said, look, you can have all the benefits you used to get and what you paid the $2 million for, but you can now have it for free if you'll cover our event. You believe that? Talk about a cost savings, right? Talk about an, they built an asset that was discreet and, and different from the products or services that they sell. That's how valuable it is. This one I found, this is Matthew Patrick in Game Theory. I don't know if you've got any gamers out there. I found out about this one as I was walking through our computer room at home and my son was watching this video called Game Theory and he was talking about subscriber burn. As I walked in, I'm like, subscriber burn? That's my industry. So I sat down and I watched the video. Each of these videos is between 12 and 17 minutes long. We actually put Matthew Patrick on the cover of our magazine, Chief Content Officer, and tried to figure out how did he do this? Now a multimillionaire, he's got a fast-growing agency. Uh, he consults directly on algorithm changes for YouTube, believe it or not. But he started with the same process. He started by focusing on vid one, one video a week, every week, on YouTube consistently over time. So he's got more than five million fans, subscribers on YouTube, billions of views, built this multi-million dollar company, and now I, it's hard to believe that he's actually consulting directly for YouTube itself. I don't know if you think this is interesting, right? I mean. Our smites goddesses too sexy. I don't even know what that means. It doesn't mean anything to me, but my, son, my, my sons love it. They watch this stuff all the time. So everyone, everyone, the same model. And by the way, this is the same publishing model that's been used for 100 plus years. We think that, oh, we, we want to tell these stories and we want to send all this information out and we gotta, we're going to do it on Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and we're going to blog about it. We're going to do videos and pocket. We, we basically throw up content all over the place. That doesn't work. This is what works. One content type, one platform consistently deliver over time. So that's building the base. But now we've got, we want to convert, right? We want to build an audience. We want to build an audience of subscribers. So the fourth step is always, once you build that base, now we want to harvest the audience. We want to build audience over time. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about social media. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not a social media hater. I'm very active on social media. We do a lot of social media activities at Content Marketing Institute. But I'm going to, I'm going to want you to think a little bit differently if you don't. So here's, here's Facebook, here's Starbucks Facebook page. Got, now over 40 million people that have liked their page. When Starbucks does an organic update to their fans on Facebook, how many of those 40 million are gonna see it? Somebody yell it out. 3,000. 3, That's actually probably pretty close. It's less than 1%. And by the way, Facebook changed their algorithm, right? And that's fine, they can do that. But we played by one set of rules and said, hey, if we create an audience on Facebook, they will start seeing our updates. And Facebook said, no, it doesn't work anymore. 
Now, Facebook may be a really good advertising platform for us now, but not really good from an organic standpoint. Starbucks spent millions of dollars building an audience on somebody else's platform, and now they're paying for it. All right? Let's look at, uh, don't even get me started with Google Plus, right? I don't even know what it is. Is it dead? Is I think it's dead. <laughs> Maybe. You know better than I do. All I know is in the last year, they had two major reorganizations. They said, oh, it's still going. They changed their logo with the new Google logo. I mean, I don't know, but are we using it or not? I've got, I've got two and a half million followers here from Starbucks. What do I do? Put all this energy in this, into creating this platform, and then it's gone. And think about all the changes that have happened lately. lately. Like LinkedIn's changing their, how their groups work. Uh, what was it, last week, um, YouTube came out and said, oh, okay, well, if you're a partner, if you're selling advertising on, on our YouTube platform, you have to sign this other agreement to get in YouTube Red, our subscription program, or basically we're going to make you private. They're changing rules all the time. And we are giving them all this power and trying to build audiences on those other platforms. And that is not the way to go. This is what I want you to focus on. I want you to build your own subscribers that you have some control over, specifically email. You're going to say, oh my god, email? Email's dead. Email, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. Email is more powerful than it has ever been before. Copy bloggers, a copy blogger wouldn't have a business model unless they had those 200,000 plus email subscribers that they started with. You know, Moz, Rand Fishkin and Moz has done the same thing, built over 100,000 subscribers in the same way using this Content Inc. model. We talk about them in the book in the introduction. Think Money Magazine from TD Ameritrade. I love this example. This is a print magazine, believe it or not, and it, it goes to very active traders. So these are traders that are trading 50, 100, 150, 200 plus times a day. And they're sending a print educational magazine to them, Think Money, and the people at Ameritrade wanted to kill it. They're like, we're an innovative company. We don't want to do print anymore. We don't even know if it works. We can't measure it. it took them two years to get the data. And two years, what they found was is that traders that subscribe and read this magazine trade five times more than those that don't. How's that for ROI? Now, the CMO that wanted to kill that project is now raising up and said, look at this magazine. It's awesome. This is fantastic. We need to do more print. So I want you to think about building your own subscribers and your own audience just like a publisher or a media company would. Now here's my very sophisticated yay boo sliding scale of subscribership. <laughs> now by the way, these are all good. These are all, these are all good. I want, all, I want Facebook fans. I want Twitter followers. I want LinkedIn connections. I want all these things. But they don't, they're not all equal, right? I have the least control down here. Like, look at YouTube, for example. Let's say I build subscribers on YouTube, which is fine. But I may have a couple videos out there, but if engagement isn't working right and YouTube al YouTube's algorithm doesn't like it, they might say, I'm going to show Jimmy Fallon videos instead of your stupid video. They absolutely they have the right to do that with their own platform. We have more opportunities at the top. Where do we have some control? So if you think you're using all these social media subscribership channels, we want to move them up the chain. Up every opportunity up the chain. So this is what I want you to think about social media. Absolutely use it. I know we've got some speakers later that are going to talk about their own platforms. That's great. I'm all in on that. But I really want you to think from a business standpoint that you might get up tomorrow morning and they may not exist anymore. They may be gone. And if you think about it that way, you start thinking about where you can get a little bit of that control, a little bit more data, and then you can use that data to create better customer connections. You might say, but Joe, what about BuzzFeed? They're like the poster child for social media engagement, and they're doing all these videos. And All right, so here's what I want you to do. Take the BuzzFeed test. Follow the trail of calls to action when you look at BuzzFeed content. You know where it leads? Email. Because they're scared, just like everyone else. It's like, oh, we've got all these social media fans and everything, but we don't control that. How can we? We can do that through They've got hundreds of different email opportunities to get into, segment into different ways for whatever. New York Times just mentioned they're going from 23 e-newsletters to 35 different e-newsletters. Some of the e-newsletters, targeted ones that they're creating, are getting 50 to 70% open rate. I know what you're thinking. Email inbox, it's too cluttered. How do we cut through? 
you all have the one, two, or three different emails that you open every day. They're the ones that you're starring or the ones that you're reading, and then you're saying the rest is trash. We're, we're getting rid of spam. We don't want any of that. You need to be one of the one, two, or threes that they open every day. You need to be that go-to resource for them. So I want you to think about how some of these companies are doing it. And this is totally blatant. And right now it works. It might not work tomorrow, but right now it works. We talked about John Lee Dumas, an entrepreneur on fire. He has iTunes subscribers. He has hundreds of thousands of iTunes subscribers that he ultimately has no control over. So what does he do? All his calls to action go to his website, and he's not even shy about it. This is his homepage. You want to join Fire Nation? Sign up. Get a lot of value. I need the sign up. I actually was, you know, we talked about this strategy as a popover. We use Pippity integrates with uh, our WordPress platform. And I was like, I was, it felt a little bit like a used car salesman. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but, but it didn't pop over. And of course, you all know, hey, is it good? I don't know, whatever. We tried it. We tested it, which uh, you should always test this, right? You just shouldn't always take anyone at face value. I said, let's see how it works. You know, the, give away a nice little in, piece of information and you know, get them to sign up and feel part of the social proof, part of the community. 65% of our daily signups, we get about 150 to 170 signups a day. 65% come from this form. So that already I'm interested. And what we also found out as we went through the buyer's journey and figured out what those people do, they become some of our best customers. So now I love this. Actually, if I could put two popovers on my page, I would do it. I need more popovers. It really, not some, I don't know what's gonna happen. I mean, things are changing with mobile. I don't know if it works, if it's going to work, but right now it works really, really well because we wanna make sure we get those subscribers and those connections, not leads. They're not leads yet. These are just, we're just, starting to build an information. That's where most of us, I think, go wrong with all of our popovers and pop-ups and getting, we think right away, oh, this is a lead. It's not a lead. We gotta build that relationship first and we gotta qualify it. We gotta know where they're at and then maybe we can create a lead out of it. A lot of you are doing this already and you know it, but we wanna make sure, what do we need? We need an amazing e-newsletter. Most of the e-newsletters we're all putting out are terrible. They're all talking about us we're sending out millions of emails. I want you to have an amazing e-newsletter. That's the one that they open. And you need an amazing, remarkable exchange of value. What is that report, that e-book? That's something you're going to give them so you can, they will actually give you a correct email address. I, you ever, do you guys have this? Some of the, we get some really profane emails. <laughs> like, I freaking hate pop-ups at gmail.com. Like, we'll get a lot of those as we go through. So you want real, because we want them to be, a, we want them to get the information. We want them to see that it's value. We're trying to create value. So we've har we built the base, we harvested the audience. Now we're gonna diversify. Once you build a minimum viable audience, whatever that is for you, it could be 1,000, it could be 5,000. In our case, it was 10,000. In Matthew Patrick's, in Games Theory's case, his was 500,000. He's targeting consumers. So whatever that is, we're gonna get to that number and then we're gonna diversify. Most of us diversify right away. Oh, we're gonna do all this stuff. I don't want you to do that. I want you to diversify later. Now, we're gonna look at the three and three model. For those of you that are looking for, hey, I wanna be a rock star in my personal career, every one of the case studies we looked at have these three, so this is the three and three model. They have an amazing blog, they have a book, like a really, like a drop on the desk book, a real book, and then they're out there public speaking. We see that in every case. From a corporate standpoint, it's these three. We want the leading digital platform, the leading print platform, and the leading in-person platform. I know we're all talking digital, but I'm telling you, if you look at all the major media companies out there, our models that are in the book that we talk about, but all of the, the BuzzFeeds of the world, the Huffington Post of the world, New York Times, look at, they all have these three. They're all building the three legs of the stool. So now we have to think about how we're gonna build those out and take the next step as we go. I'll give you some data on it. This is our data from Content Marketing Institute. This is what we found, why diversification is key. So these are all the people that came to Content Marketing World, our big show, and we looked at, well, what's the, how do they get there? What's the path? We found out that the magic number is three. If they sign up for three different things that we offer, let's say a subscription to CCO or one of our webinars, they sign up for our email newsletter, weekly, daily, whatever, it's the three is the number, they're way more likely to come to Content Marketing World. We see a significant behavior change by subscription to three things. And this is why we want to diversify. So now we have got 14 or a bunch of different things that we offer. But we didn't. We started with just the platform. We basically 24 months, and all we were doing was blogging, building the audience. That was it, nothing else. Then we launched the magazine. Then we launched 
on and on and on. Let's go back to our friend Andy. Does Andy do this model? Does the chicken whisperer do this? I want to know if Andy does this model. Right? We started, really built his base on the radio show, the 20,000 listeners every week. He's consistently creating that. Then, of course, there's the Chicken Whisperer magazine, the leading magazine in the industry, mind you. And, of course, it's the ultimate guide to raising chickens in your backyard, which is the number one book in the category. There's only two books in the category, by the way. But this is the number one book. But the, even the Chicken Whisperer is doing this strategy. Let's look at Joy Cho. Fantastic designer, built a multi-million dollar uh, company, started with just a blog. Uh, now she's got projects with Microsoft and Target and Johnson & Johnson, these design integrations. It's just amazing what she's been able to do. She started in 2005, three really short blogs a day, every day. And I mean short, I'm talking like 100 words short. Every day, that's all she did. Five years, 2010, she started writing books. 2011, she started on Pinterest. Now she's one of the most pinned people on Pinterest, 13.1 million followers, and she's just blown up into this huge, fast-growing company. But again, started first the blog, and then she started to diversify after the fact. And of course, we talked about how we did the same thing, just the blog, then we did the event content marketing world, then we did the magazine, Chief Content Officer, then we did our podcast, This Old Marketing, after we built the base first. So this is not easy. You're gonna, this takes time to build. You have to have patience to do it. For those of you that have a lot of budget out there, what we know when we talk to a lot of the enterprise, we work with mostly multi-billion dollar companies, they have a lot of cash, a lot of cash on the sidelines right now, and a lot of them are looking at, well, maybe we're impatient. Maybe we don't want to build it. Maybe we want to buy it. And I think there's a huge opportunity for all of us, no matter what size company you're with, I think there's an opportunity to look into a niche and actually purchase. Let me give you some examples. JPEG Magazine, 2009, going out of business after the Great Recession, had 300,000 people, subscribers, subscribed to JPEG Magazine. Advertising plummeted, couldn't get find any support, what are we gonna do? All, no other media companies wanted to buy them. Adorama, Adorama came around. Adorama sells photography equipment, JPEG Magazine, is an educational resource for photographers. Does that make a fit? Yes. They bought, purchased them in 2009 with a buying group. It's been a great relationship for both parties. It's a it's definite win. Adorama didn't have to build that platform. They purchased it. I know a lot of you are familiar with marketing automation company HubSpot. They had a sales blog. They had a marketing blog. They said, we want an agency blog specifically for agencies. Did they want to build it? They said, no, it's going to take time. It takes patience to do that. Agency Post was available. They just purchased Agency Post. Now they have an agency blog. And we're seeing deals happen in the tens of thousands up to multi-million dollars, but I think that we're going to see, you know, the next, you heard it here, next 12 to 18 months, you're gonna see rampant M&A around brands buying media companies, bloggers, influencers. I want you to list where are your customers hanging out in that particular niche. I want you to list those sites, and I want you to make decisions. Are we gonna partner with them? Do we wanna buy them, or do we do nothing? I think it's a huge opportunity for you to speed to market there. Here's the last one, and then we're going to get into some questions. So get, if you have any questions, let's get those ready. So you're all thinking, okay, great, Joe. Now we want us to make some money off of this. What's monetization? How do we monetize? Lots of different ways to measure how your content is performing. This is my favorite. What's the difference between those who subscribe to my content and those that don't? Once you get the connection of a subscriber, then how do they behave different? Do they buy more? Do they stay longer? What do they do differently? We can measure this. But the problem is we it takes time to do that. You have to go through at least a buyer's cycle to get to a point where you've got the kind of data that's going to make sense. Right? And you could, there are nine different ways. We talk about all of them in the book. To, whether you're making money, you want to sell more products and services. Are you going to launch advertising programs? Are you going to increase your products? If you're going to uh, more loyal customers like John Deere does, maybe it's a data-driven activity like Kraft Foods uh, has craftrecipes.com. They mine data. That's all R&D. That's all for new product development. Maybe they're launching events, whatever the case is. How'd copy blogger do it? Right? Every, blogging every day, built 200,000 subscribers. Now they're selling software as a service products. 
How did TD Ameritrade do it? They wanted to create a behavior change in their current customers that they would actually buy more, generate sales that way. This is one of my favorite ones that maybe you've heard of River Pools and Spas. This is Marcus Sheridan. So Marcus likes to talk about how, so basically, real quick story is 2007, 2008, remember those times? And I mean, basically, River Pools and Spas installs fiberglass pools. Who was installing fiberglass pools in 2008? How many people? The people that put down $50,000 deposits wanted it back. They said, look, we're hurting. You know, I need to pay the mortgage. I need to put the kids through school. I can't do the pool thing anymore. What are we going to do? Started to basically do the blog like Indium did, and he said, we're going to answer all the questions that nobody else is an answering. He, if you go to any kind of search terms around fiberglass pools, fiberglass pools versus concrete pools, how much does it cost, you know, questions that weren't being answered, river pools and spas comes up. They are now world-renowned brand. They went from fifth in their market in 2007 to in 2011 installing more fiberglass pools than any company in North America. Fifth in their market to more than it, and that all they did was they created the blog. That's the only thing they did, the most awesome swimming pool blog. That was it. It's not sexy, but it works. So I want you to create the plan, but I want you to focus on building an audience. I want you to focus on building. This is the thing that I want you to really think about. This is the thing I truly believe. You have to create value before you extract value. Create value first before you extract value. That's where you need a little bit of patience. We're all, we're all so quick to get the leads and to get them in and to work them down the system and get them to sales and sell and sell and sell. But if we take a little bit more thoughtful approach, I think you'll see amazing changes of what we saw for those in the book. So I really do believe this. I think you have to be the leading expert in your particular niche that you're targeting. And I want you to do the test. Look at the content you're creating. Is it any different than any other piece of content out there in the industry? Are you telling the same story as everyone else? You have to tell a different story. And a loyal audience will lead you to revenue. Like all these people, we found, I found I wasn't alone. Lots of different people, I see Rand up there as well. Same model, we talk about him in the book. So here's your takeaways. This is what I want you to think about. So find a niche where you can be the leading expert in the world. I want you to develop that content mission. Focus on that content marketing mission. The, what's the base? Build that base. Your content type, what's the platform? Deliver consistently over time. Don't build your house on rented land. Don't build your content house on, in places and social media platforms that you cannot control. Build an audience of opt-in subscribers. To do that, you need an amazing e-newsletter and a remarkable download. Then you diversify. Use that rule of three. Print, in person, digital. Figure out what your subscribers do differently. Everything you do has to focus on audience first, audience first, and then products. If you build a loyal relationship with your audience, they will tell you what they want to buy. They will absolutely, they will know, like, and trust you even more, and they will pretty, and that's what we found out in the book. All these case studies, you can pretty much sell whatever you want once you build that loyal relationship with them. But you have to be patient. Have to be patient. So for those of you that have people in your organization that aren't patient and want immediate results, do a pilot program. Six month pilot program, get everyone in the room. This is what we're trying to do. Know that you need more time, but at least get the budget for six months so that you can start the process. Did everyone get at least one thing? That's not good. Did everyone get at least one thing? All right. Did anyone get more than one thing? Yeah. Hopefully I've exceeded your expectations. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. This is, before we get to, so I know we have time for a couple questions before we do. We just created our documentary called The Story of Content. It's available on Amazon Prime or at thestoryofcontent.com. If you have any people that don't believe in content marketing and just don't get it, this is 43 minutes. We're starting to show it in universities and schools across the country, around the world. Agencies are getting together, groups are getting together. If you want more information on putting kits together, let me know, because we've got screening kits. I think that this is how you're gonna turn uh, non-believers into believers, hopefully get you some more budget. All right, do we have some time for a few questions? Five minutes for questions? And if the first question gets a book, because I got one right here for you. I can't. We got a question in the back? Thank you. Here comes the mic. Thank you very much. 
Oh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so you talked about the different c content type that needs to be developed, text, images, video. Yep. And so I'm out to launch a blog in the next uh, couple of months. So I've been thinking about, like, do I change it from, okay, I'm going to start with text, then I'm going to go to video. But you mentioned that we should stick with one type. Did, did, you, did I hear you clearly? Was it one type, like saying, oh, I'm going to do a video and just stay consistent? Is there a problem if you mix it up, obviously, with text, images, and video? So when I'm talking about textual, I mean, if you, you, you're going to integrate images into that because that's just good usability. So if you're talking about images, but I, if you're... Sorry, I apologize. Infographics. I, infographics. That that's fine. I'm consider, I'm, when, you, when you're looking at your platform, your key platforms and textual, you can in, absolutely integrate pictures and imagery and stuff into that. But that's still your main platform is a text-based blog platform that you're, you're going after. I would, be, I, mean, I would just be careful about, oh, I'm going to start integrating video or audio and whatever, and don't get distracted. Focus on that platform. And what well, we saw the case studies in the book, yes, they integrated imagery, but it was all about building that blog platform first, and that was what they were going for. And for usability's sake, they would integrate pictures into that, but they're not going out and say, oh, okay, here's a video here. I'll give you an example of Moz, right? Anybody know, uh, look at Whiteboard Friday for Moz? Love my Whiteboard Friday, right? Think about how he started. He started with the, just the blog first. Blog, blog, built the subscribers. Then he launches Whiteboard Friday as the regular ongoing, but he had the audience built first. So focus on that content type first, and then start integrating your Whiteboard Friday type things, your, your secondary, your podcast offering, or whatever. But yes, yeah, so integrate images, but that's still considered, at least according to how we talk about it in the book, still textual. Good, absolutely. Right, lots of questions coming in. Got one there, one here. Hey, Joe, how's it going? Good. Um, you mentioned early on uh, about how if you're targeting uh, multiple personas with your content strategy, you're probably going to end up failing. Yep. Um, while I understand that aspect, from a B2B standpoint, a lot of companies are starting to dive heavily into multiple personas, um, who they're targeting. Yep. Um, what, what do you suggest these companies do if they've already invested in creating all these multiple personas and you know and turn their content more effective okay so a great question about the personas so if you look at the average b2b sale you have between seven and nine personas some of them are by direct decision makers some of them are gatekeepers some of them are influencers so you're looking at that now you have to make a decision about who you're going to focus on what most people are doing, what most B2B companies do, is they say, oh, we're going to do a content initiative to these three personas. And I'm saying, OK, good. You're going to fail. There's no way you're going to be relevant enough for those three. Let's start with one. So let's say you make a decision. And that's why you're not going to do a content marketing initiative to all nine of those. You're maybe going to pick three, but you should start with one. So I'm going to start with the one. And we're going to build a loyal audience there. And then once we do that, we're going to go to two. I'll give you a great example of who did that really well. Huffington Post. Huffington Post has what, 240, 250 different blogs now? You know what they started with? One, to one audience. And then when they built that audience, you know what they did? Then they went to two, and then they went to three. So most B2B companies fail right away because, oh, we wanna, we're gonna target the CEO and the CIO and the CFO and the plant, they're just trying to target as many people as possible and go broad. Never will cut through, never will be relevant enough. There's too much competition out there. So you have to make choices. And this is why we call it strategy. So just to make sure, okay, which is one we're going to go after? And maybe the other six, maybe you'd say we're gonna go after these one, two, and the other six or seven, you're going to target and communicate with them in other ways, but not necessarily build a content platform around it. It's a great question. We have time for two more questions, I think. Lots of questions, thank you. By the way, I'll be around for a while, and if anyone wants to devalue their book, I'm happy to sign it <laughs> later. Hi. Um, Hi. I work with a client that has, uh, it's, it's a grocery retailer, and they recently came out with a newsletter. And what they are trying to do is they offer a lot of recipes and that type of content. Yep. But in addition to that, they also kind of talk about themselves. They have coupons and things like that. And is there a place for that? Because I know you mentioned John Deere only mentioned themselves three to 15 times. And I feel like this grocery retailer kind of talks about themselves quite a lot. Um, but I'm not really too sure how they can balance that with the coupons and things like that. Exactly. So 
don't have a problem with, so let's say you take the newsletter and you have certain parts that you're going to talk about yourself. You, you can do that, but you have to limit it and you have to think about it just like a call to action on a conversion and a landing page. Like most, the way that content is being done right now is there's, there, there's all kinds of things that most landing page, oh, you know, this is a benefit, this is a feature, this is great, and you're looking at all these different buttons, but really a best landing page is a very simple one that has one call to action. So I would look at, okay, here's the, con we're, the content is the content. We're not gonna do a bait and switch, we're just talking about helpful content for that person, and then if you have some calls to action to different things outside of that content, that works very well. Most of the programs that we talk about in the book actually did that, but how they do it is, when you look at email, if it's an educational email, that for the most part, that educational email just does that. It just teaches, it just helps. And then if they're having a separate offering, they usually keep that, that's a separate sales messaging. You're not mixing up, mixing it up. So if you have to have it together, and I totally get the conversations you're having, I would say, let's be strategic about it. And uh, you might want to do a count. How many stories do we have versus how many calls to action? Let's say for this newsletter, we really want to focus on having this one thing happen. So let's focus on that for this issue, and then let's not have 20,000 coupons in it. Great question. One, we have one more question, real quick. Who we got? Got one back there, got one here, got one here. Thank you. Oh, did you see he just walked right by you? That was just, <laughs> that was just wrong. <laughs> All right, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Um, Hi. Thanks for always replying to my tweets, Thank by the you. way. Um, I was wondering how important is it to have some kind of like recognizable face to your brand? Kind of like how you are with Content Marketing Institute. Does it give your competition a much bigger advantage if they have like a recognizable celebrity face to their brand? I think it absolutely does help. It's not necessary to do that. I mean, if you look at what Red Bull Media House has created, if you look at what Kraft Recipes has created, if you look at what John Deere created, they've got experts, regular columnists that they're starting to build up as influencers, but they don't necessarily have one like maybe myself or Rand Fishkin or Brian Clark or sort of theirs. But look at what happens over time. Like Brian Clark doesn't have the notoriety and copy blogger that he used to have because he's taking sort of a back seat and he's positioning other experts to do that. I'm, we're trying to do the same thing at CMI. I would just say it should be part of your influencer strategy to integrate influencers in your own company as well as outside companies to make that work, to give you your own authority. It's not necessary, but it does help. But I think that if you don't have one and you want to start integrating influencers, you should. If you have people in your own company that you can lift up, absolutely I would do that. And I think the, the savviest, most innovative companies are doing that with their content marketing program. They're saying, hey, let, let them be rock stars too, and it will, will rising tide will lift all, lift all ships. So it's a great, great question. Thank you very much. I'll be around. Have a great, great day. Appreciate it.